Hello, all. I know you're still coming in, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of uh, ground to cover today. Uh, so I'll give you a minute more here as you're coming in. Uh, so I am Greg Taylor. I am an engineering manager at, uh, on Reddit's infrastructure team. And today I'll be sharing the origin story of Kubernetes at Reddit. We'll cover some of the historical context, go over the motivation for our adoption, and talk through what we're building. But, uh, first of all, for my own, for my own gratification, uh, by a raise of hands, uh, how, how many are familiar with Reddit at some level? Okay, let the record show that there are quite a few of you. <laughs> but for everybody else, uh, what is Reddit? Uh, and it depends on who you ask, but today we tend to define Reddit as a network of communities called subreddits. Uh, and then within these subreddits, users are able to share content in the form of text, images, videos, or links. And this is where it gets interesting. Other, user, other users can then comment on these submissions, which is where a lot of the magic happens at Reddit. And from there, upvotes and downvotes by fellow users determine what submissions and comments bubble to the top. And through a combination of user-driven moderation and voting, subreddits end up being curated sources for the things that interest you. And uh, due to a monthly active user base uh, of over 400 million, we are home to subreddits that cover just about every imaginable topic. News, politics, sports, technology, music, underwater basket weaving, and of, uh, of course, whatever more obscure stuff you might be into, but uh, I won't, no judgment here. Uh, and whether you're, into, you're, you're looking to participate in discussion, seek or offer support, uh, or debate the finer points of YouTube haikus, <laughs> or see pictures of birds with arms instead of wings, uh, you'll be able to find a home in one of our 140,000 communities. Uh, and let's take a look at what one of these communities looks like. Uh, shameless plug here, this is our Kubernetes subreddit, located at reddit.com slash r slash Kubernetes. And here you'll find over 15,000 Kubernetes sharing articles, tips, asking questions, and sharing in victory and defeat. Uh, and we've got, the, we've got discussion posts up for each day of KubeCon as well, so make sure to stop by and say hi. And if you haven't already, uh, if you haven't already check it out. Uh, I'm a little bit biased, but I consider this to be one of the better uh, communities for Kubernetes on the web. So, with our briefest of brief introductions to Reddit taken care of, let's get started on the main event, the origin story of Kubernetes at Reddit. So, our story begins back in simpler times. Early 2016, to be more specific. Uh, and so you'll see our lovable monolith pictured in the middle, standing alone, there's no other services around it. We had about 20 engineers in total, uh, which were split into around three different engineering teams. And since the story is from the perspective of the infrastructure team, let's talk a little bit about what life uh, looked like for us back in 2016. Uh, we handled a mixture of operations and some back-end development on the monolith. And since we had a relatively static monolith, uh, the infrastructure team was also uh, responsible for handling the provisioning and configuration of all of our systems. Uh, additionally, we handled most of the non-trivial debugging uh, when things did go wrong, since we had enough access to poke at the dustiest corners of the infrastructure and the code base. Uh, and this arrangement served us well for well around a, a decade, until the middle of 2016. Change was afoot. Uh, okay, bear with me for a minute, I swear this is relevant. <laughs> Anybody here watch the original Power Rangers? Okay, there's enough of you here. You remember that bit where the evil villain Rita Verpulsa was like, Make my monster, bro! And then the rubber suit guy goes, <laughs> That is kind of what happened to Reddit in 2016. <laughs> we, uh, we, if you can imagine our, our CEO, Spez or Steve, saying that, that's totally how it went down. Uh, so, uh, started the year, uh, maybe a little bit less than 20 engineers. Ended the year over 60 engineers, and it only picked up from then. We didn't slow down in, in, in 2017 and 2018. We kept adding new, uh, we kept adding new teams, and they kept adding new servers. You know, just all sorts of interesting things are going on there. So, uh, as far as the trajectory of this uh, into the now present, we're right around under 200 engineers. So that's a uh, you know, right around a 10x increase from uh, the beginning of 2016, which is pretty substantial for us. Anyway. As our ranks grew, we began having difficulty in scaling the development of the monolith uh, with our rapidly growing team. Uh, and while there are plenty of examples of organizations successfully developing against the monolith, our particular monolith was, uh, was, was fragile and full of sharp edges uh, that had accumulated over almost 10 years. Uh, and it was difficult to make changes uh, without unexpected breakages. There was layers and layers of caching and all sorts of things in there, uh, nasty bits. 
so development was much like, uh, this was much like the development equivalent of the butterfly effect, but with a lot more explosions. And uh, as a result of this, our productivity was not scaling as well as we had hoped as the org group. So we had a spirited gathering to decide a path forward. And our goal was to set a course that would allow many engineering teams to efficiently develop and operate alongside one another. And we considered a number of options, running the gamut from rehabilitating the monolith to the ever dreaded complete rewrite. And after much discussion and gnashing of teeth, we decided to, what did they say, Greg? Tell me, tell me. Split our, start picking apart the monolith into a service-oriented architecture or an SOA. And previously, as a smaller organization, the additional complexity of an SOA was unattractive to us. But as a larger and still rapidly growing organization uh, with a difficult monolith, we saw this as the best path forward. We felt that this would give us a better separation of concerns and understood that this would come with a, with a few new problems to deal with. <laughs> with the decision made, we plunged headfirst into our brave new service-oriented world. And lo and behold, all of our problems were solved. We stood up our own Death Star of services and trotted off into the sunset. Thanks for joining me today, folks. That's all. I'll I'm, I'm, well, see you later. Or maybe not. Uh, so we started standing up new services. And we hired for and we built out new engineering teams. And those new teams stood up their own services. And before we knew it, routing all of these new services through the infrastructure team for productionization became problematic. We had became a bottleneck. And when I say we, the infrastructure team, service owners had to wait for us to stand up and configure new infrastructure for them. And also, we handled most of the incident response and production debugging since we had the most permissions. Uh, can any, has anybody been here? Just a few? All right, you know where this is going, right? <laughs> this led to frustration all around. The infrastructure team was discouraged by the constant pages and the hefty backlog of the teams waiting for us to do things. And the other teams were rightly uh, not pleased with having to wait long periods for new services or changes. So uh, seeking some short-term relief, we trained of the few more infrastructure-oriented teams to uh, use our standard tooling, our, our standard infrastructure and operations tooling to uh, do some of this work on their own. And these teams were able to gather a measure of independence that relieved some of the pressure on us but uh, is, this, is this the solution to our problems here, expecting everybody to you know, moonlight as an infrastructure engineer? Give me like some nods or some shaking of heads. Oh man, I got like two. Yeah, no, thank you, spirited, yes. <laughs> this wasn't something that we could do for the entire the organization. Uh, and the truth of it is that uh, not all teams want to or are able to operate the, the full stack for their service. There is really a spectrum of uh, infra comfort to contend with. Uh, you know, for example, when faced with the prospect of doing infrastructure work, some teams will eagerly dive in, no problem. Others would soon throw their laptop in the trash, leave the building, and change careers to something more pleasant like whatever this is. But you, yeah, an SOA, good. <laughs> but what is it that we really want here? Let's step back and look at these issues from a higher level perspective. The infrastructure team is feeling the weight of a large backlog of work from other teams. They're also feeling fatigued by the volume of diagnostic and incident response work. And on the other side of this, our fellow engineering teams are frustrated by having to wait on us for service provisioning. And by extension, they're feeling like they're not in control of the, their services lifecycle. Uh, and also, perhaps most importantly of all, uh, to our sleep, uh, un the service owners are unable to debug many issues in production themselves which is a really fun place to be, if you might imagine. Uh, so to summarize our situation, we were lacking the ability for engineering teams to fully own their service. So we worked to establish Reddit's definition of service ownership. And we define this uh, as saying that a service owner at Reddit is empowered and expected to develop their service from start to finish, to deploy their service early and often, and once in production, they're expected to operate their service. This includes owning the availability and performance of said service. And after hearing all this, you may say to yourself, yes, Greg, this all sounds great, but uh, how do we get there? Well, we have to get away from expecting engineering teams to piece together services from a, a few dozen building blocks, uh, many of which are outside their technical background. And instead, we'll point engineering teams at a well-manicured path from concept to production. That sounds lovely, doesn't it? Uh, this path to production should be explicitly defined and assume no prior exposure to our stack. We'll expose the smallest possible technical surface area to the user, 
avoiding the need to learn a dozen new tools and technologies. And to execute on this vision, we needed to package up our knowledge, process, best practices, and other things into a more accessible form. I'd like to introduce you to Infrared, our Reddit infrastructure product built on Kubernetes. The rest of this talk will go into more detail about the theory behind and the implementation of Infrared. So, to summarize the mission for Infrared, a service owner should be able to develop, deploy, and operate their service. And we must allow for this regardless of an engineer's background and infrastructure. And you're going to hear me say that those previous two sentences quite a bit here. So bear with me and also understand that these are, these are just central to our, our philosophy. Uh, it may look a little bit different at your company, but have something like this and, and stick to it. Uh, so uh, we've defined a mission statement or whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, and the idea here is that if an engineer passes the bar for engineering at Reddit, they should be able to own a service. Uh, and we'll start by zooming in on just the develop portion of this. Underpinning much of our offering is a Reddit service specification. In order for us to build an accessible and productive experience for our engineers, we need our services to be of a similar shape. And uh, that means that we have to establish some standards to be followed regardless of the language or choice of frameworks. We've standardized things like our RPC protocol, how we set and retrieve secrets, and how we emit metrics and traces, and also how we structure our logs. Uh, we have encoded our standards into a language-independent service specification. And from there, we have service frameworks for each language uh, in use at Reddit. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and all of these per-language per service frameworks uh, uh, implement that specification that we're talking about here. And if you'd like an illustration of this, you can see our Python implementation of the service spec on GitHub. It's under our Reddit organization, and it's called Baseplate. And mind you, this is very opinionated. It is probably not going to be useful to you out of the box, but this may inspire you or otherwise inform uh, similar processes happening at your respective organization. So check it out. So with our, our service specific specification in hand, the beginning of our development process starts with a code generator. And we use something called Cookie Cutter by Audrey Greenfield. Anybody you know what that is? OK. well. Uh, just a few. Uh, basically, this allows us to turn out a service stub that follows our service spec. And this gets us as far as a hello world type state of development. Uh, and the generator project also includes supporting pieces like a Docker file and CI and deploy configs. And since all new services follow our service specification, we are also able to generate Helm charts for the new service. Our Reddit service Helm charts are not tied to particular languages or libraries. And that's very important for us in defining that specification we can mix and match languages with uh, these generated home charts. And uh, this is a much better experience for the developers. And by offering automation to kickstart a new service, our service bootstrapping process is much easier. And uh, it also uh, avoids the expectation that all engineers know how to write a home chart from scratch, which uh, you'll see here that is a, that is a very inhumane to subject your, thing, your, your, your engineers to. So uh, consider uh, you know, whatever, whatever approach you like, be it abstraction or automation or both. Uh, strongly consider it. Uh, and now that we have a new service and its corresponding Helm chart ready, we're, we're, it's time to start development. And for this purpose, we use Google Scaffold to facilitate that process. And this gives us an edit, rebuild, refresh loop that is accessible and familiar to our engineers. And as far as some of the thought process behind this and our, our development process, some of the major considerations are that it should be accessible without a deep understanding of Kubernetes. It must be as similar to production as possible. It should reuse the same Helm charts and Docker images in development, staging, and production. And, and this is a recent one that we've, we've had a really uh, hard time dealing with, but we must avoid exhausting our standard dev laptops resources. And uh, the primary culprit here is memory for us. Uh, and as an additional interesting note, we have historically used Minikube locally, but are instead starting to shift more of this uh, development flow to a remote clusters. Uh, due to the resources required to run the full tapestry of services. Uh, I would love to chat with you a little bit more out of, this, out of band, so come talk to us after the presentation if you'd like. Uh, so, with development covered, let's talk about how we build, test, and deploy our services. We use something called Drone to run tests and build artifacts, and the artifacts are mostly in the form of Docker images. And there was a time where we were driving, depo driving deploys via Drone and a Helm plugin, but we quickly found that we needed more than a series of Helm upgrade or Helm install calls. And Helm and Tiller together only have a rudimentary understanding of the things that they are deploying. Uh, this means that in many cases, our deploy flow was more fire and forget than we had wanted. 
uh, even when using Helm's, uh, Helm's uh, dash dash wait flag and a few other tricks. We needed something that would better understand the state of the objects that we are creating or updating. And as we move more towards a, towards a more automated future of merge and deploy queues, we also needed something that could check our instrumentation and pause a rollback when encountering failures or performance shifts. And after considering the options, we chose Spinner Crew to orchestrate deploys to our Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and to minimize the setup work, we've templated out a set of standard pipelines using JSONnet. Uh, and these are included in our new service cookie cutter. So you're starting to see how this ties together a little bit. Within these pipelines, we're rendering the, the, the services Helm charts to YAML, and then applying that YAML via Spinnaker's V2 Kubernetes provider. And the result of all of this is that the users get feedback as uh, to how the deploy is progressing, along with helpful inline diagnostics when things go wrong. And uh, we're really excited about the future extensibility that all, all of the APIs in Spinnaker offer to us. So, uh, we we're not bound to the Spinnaker UI long term, and we can do all sorts of fancy stuff. Uh, to illustrate how all this comes together, let's talk through a typical staging or production deploy flow. First, a developer pushes to a services canonical repo. Then, our CI system runs the services tests and publishes a Docker image. From here, we offer a choice of two standard deploy flows. Service owners can elect to have CI trigger a deploy automatically, or they can take matters into their own hands and rely on a manual trigger. We're likely to offer additional flows and new triggers in the future. For example, chat ops, a CLI, some web-based thing other than the Spinnaker UI. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and one of the nice things about Spinnaker uh, is that we can lean on the APIs to, uh, to do interesting and, and, and new things. We're not beholden unto its default UI. Now that we've covered deploys, let's talk about how we facilitate service operation. And this is where the meat of things is, and this is probably where I suspect a lot of the interest is. So I will ramble on a bunch for you today. So first, an important bit of groundwork. The infrastructure team worked with the rest of engineering to define a contract that codifies what is expected from both parties. Service owners are expected to learn the barest of basics about Kubernetes, and they're expected to deploy, develop, deploy, and operate their own services. The infrastructure team is responsible for provisioning, maintaining, and scaling the underlying Kubernetes clusters, and if a service requires Amazon resources, a cache, a database, uh, the infrastructure team is best equipped to provision and operate those. It's not as simple as apt get installing Postgres, Memcache, or Cassandra at our scale. You're going to have a really bad time. Uh, so it's, we, don't want, we don't want all of our, our engineering teams to have to uh, take their lumps like, like we have on the infrastructure team. Uh, and finally, the infrastructure team supports and advises the rest of the engineering organization on how to design reliable, performant, and scalable services. We as an engineering organization are at our best when each team is spending the most of, of their time on the problems that they have been tasked with. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what a productive experience looks like for a service owner. Uh, and we don't want engineers to have to struggle to figure out what to do next or aimlessly slog through Kubernetes, drone, or spinnaker documentation. We instead provide a library of paint-by-numbers guides to cover common tasks and problems. For example, here's how you create a new service. Here's how to have your application assume a specific set of permissions. Here's how to enable autoscaling. Here's how to deploy an experimental release that gets a fraction of production traffic. And if we are succeeding in our goal, questions of how do I do X are responded to with a link to an existing guide or how-to. And most importantly of all, uh, in addition to all of this, we run training sessions in person and distribute uh, recordings org-wide as they happen. It's not enough to throw Kubernetes over the wall at your engineers and expect good things to happen. But all of this is for naught if service owners lack the necessary permissions to operate their service in production. In cases where a service owner needs to diagnose or intervene, they use an internal CLI called rcube, or Reddit cube CLI, very creative, uh, to trigger a web-based open ID connect flow. And if you've seen GCP's uh, gcloud CLI, uh, it has an auth flow that is very similar. We mostly ripped off that very idea. Uh, so just imagine that with Reddit uh, logos and other cute stuff. Um, after successful, su successfully authenticating, a JSON web token is written out to the developer's local cube config uh, with a short-lived token. And this token contains a payload, a signed payload, that has the engineer's username and group memberships in tow. And our RBAC policies on the cluster side are based off of these group memberships. And since we create a Kubernetes namespace per service, it then becomes a matter of granting the service owner's full permission to the namespaces for their, the services that they own. The end result is that service owners are empowered to get hands-on with their own services, 
but are unable to go spelunking in cube system or other uh, nether regions within our clusters. But, like they say, with great power comes great explosions. And fortunately, we can prevent whole classes of mistakes from happening with some forethought. And in cases where mistakes are made, we can also limit some of the damage. For example, resource limits on CPU and memory can reduce the likelihood of resource starvation. Network policies reduce the likelihood of unauthorized access. And we make these easy to include by virtue of baking these into our Helm chart generator. Coming back to the Helm chart generator, you're seeing this is an important thing. Uh, another, issue, uh, uh, another issue we've seen inside and outside of Kubernetes is a misbehaving service hammering its downstream dependencies. Retry storms, uh, just random spamming happening, uh, all sorts of other fun things, and bears oh my. Uh, and to address this, we're rolling out Istio and Envoy, which will allow us to enforce service-to-service -service rate limits, add circuit breaking, and we'll get a little bit more uh, on the observability front as well. Uh, so again, feel free to come and talk to us about this after the presentation. We're still early on, but happy to compare notes. Uh, another thing that can make for a long day is inadvertently exposing a service to the world uh, or running a questionable Docker image. Uh, we've, we've been experimenting with the CNCF's open policy agent, which will allow us to centrally define policies to prevent these and numerous things. And finally, we want to grant all of the permissions needed for a service owner to operate their service, but nothing more. Right now, we're managing RBAC po policies with per cluster YAML manifest in Git, but open policy agent will give us a more pleasant way to centrally manage these. Uh, I think there are either going to be some sessions on open policy agent or there already have been. Check it out, it's super promising stuff. But despite our best efforts, there are going to be happy little accidents. And, <laughs> okay. all right, I will wait a moment here. Uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly how it happens. And since we are now in this bold and beautiful new age of service ownership, the service owner gets paged when they decide to climb up on their truck and, uh, you know, lose control and then hit a telephone pole or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so they're, they're, they're then expected to di diagnose and resolve the issue, uh, or at least take a first uh, whack at it. And if the service owner ends up stumped or suspects an underlying, uh, an issue with the underlying infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure team is available via an escalation chain. And speaking of the infrastructure team, we are paged when there are issues with the Kubernetes clusters, caches, databases, or other bedrock pieces that require specialized knowledge to operate. If the service owner were to page us about Cassandra, for example, we're probably going to end up getting paged anyway. So uh, again, keeping us focused on the things that we're best equipped to handle. And as, a, as an added note, we, uh, we have a detailed incident response plan that the whole engineering organization uses. Incidents are announced, tracked, and end with a blameless postmortem, which is very important. As somebody who took Reddit down, uh, it was one of my first asks as an employee. So <laughs> there is that. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to credit the folks at uh, PagerDuty for making their excellent incident response guide publicly available. Uh, it had a good deal of influence on how we operate here. So if you haven't seen it, please do check it out. It is excellent. Uh, and when things do go wrong, our service owners appreciate having a full suite of tooling to assist and quickly determining root cause. Without insight into how our services are performing, a trivial problem uh, can lead to guessing games, our long or, or long and fruitless journeys as our protagonists repeatedly find that Princess, Peace, brr, Princess Peach is in another castle. Uh, and since our Reddit service specification dictates what diagnostics are to be emitted, to where, and in which formats, our users get a solid observability story out of the box. This includes a nice, uh, nice set of metrics, a default alerting story, tracing, exception and error tracking, and a cent central log aggregation and analysis. Our per language service frameworks take care of plumbing everything up instead of leaving engineers to buy overalls and curse loudly under the sink on their own. I'm probably gonna sound like a broken record, but a footnote here is that the tooling is supported by training and documentation. Quite a few of these tools require uh, some specialized knowledge to pra uh, in practice to master, so we have to be diligent in spreading that knowledge. So we've covered a lot of ground in service operation land. Uh, I'll take a moment to recap. By using Kubernetes and Infrared, our internal infrastructure product, service owners have explicitly defined responsibilities. The service owner is responsible for the health and the performance of their service. The infrastructure team is responsible for the health of the Kubernetes cluster and the other bedrock systems. Service owners have enough access to fully own their services. 
And this allows them to respond to incidents, diagnose issues, and make operational changes on their own. Uh, and also to prevent and limit damage, infrared includes a number of guardrails and safety. We can prevent a number of common mistakes through automatically enforced policies. We also reduce the likelihood of a misbehaving service impacting others via our service mesh. And finally, service owners have the tools needed to diagnose issues on their own. But what is all of this? What, this sounds great, Greg. What is, it, what is it by us? Well, we've gone over how Kubernetes and infrared enable service ownership at Reddit. Uh, as far as what it bought us, instead of the infrastructure team being a bottleneck or a frustrated and central dependency, we've stepped out of the way and have empowered the engineering organization to take ownership of our many services. The engineering teams are now able to develop, deploy, and operate their services mostly on their own. And they can do this regardless of prior engineering background. Now, I will warn you, I, I have been known to drop the occasional dad joke I might be about to do that right now, so just, uh, again, don't roll your eyes too hard. I guess that you can say that Kubernetes and infrared has helped infra the infrastructure team transform. Oh, come on, give me a token chuckle. That was pretty bad, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, thank you. I deserve that. I'm a terrible person. I feel terrible. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> Whereas we serve uh, in more of a traditional operations capacity in the past, Today, we spend more of our time building tooling, process, and automation that makes the rest of the engineering organization happier, safer, and more productive. So we'll close with some uh, details on our Kubernetes uh, adoption at Reddit. Uh, to start, we operate about seven distinct clusters and are expected to add about uh, three to six in the next few months. Uh, we tend to prefer smaller, more numerous clusters rather than larger, uh, but uh, less numerous clusters. Uh, about half of our engineering teams are now interacting with Kubernetes. Uh, those teams have deployed and are operating about 20 production level services on Kubernetes today. Those 20 services see about 10 to 20 deploys on a typical weekday. And to give you an idea of how this adoption has progressed, we involved a subset of early adopters early on in our development of infrared. And with their candid feedback, uh, we've been able to build something that represents a big leap forward for service ownership at Reddit. Uh, and an interesting note is that usage has grown at a steady clip despite us not actively pushing for wider adoption just yet. We've got some more things that we need to get in order before uh, throwing the floodgates open, uh, particularly with streamlining this uh, and on automating this, the service onboarding process that we've talked about. Uh, and finally, uh, interesting milestone, uh, we're targeting org-wide availability for infrared and Kubernetes in quarter one. So at that point, Every new service at Reddit will be provisioned on Kubernetes by default. Uh, today, it's, I think it probably happens uh, three out of four, uh, you know, three fourths of the time, but it will be the official default in quarter one. So very excited about that. Uh, and this concludes the part of our session where I ramble at you for about half an hour. Uh, we're about to open this up for q and Wanted to leave plenty of time for that, and it looks like we have succeeded in that. But uh, before, I, before we do that, I wanted to put some of my colleagues on the spot. Well, but first I want to watch them squirm a little bit. Where are you? Ah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> We're fortunate enough to have seven fine individuals from Reddit's infrastructure team in attendance today. Oh boy, I can see them sweat and they think I'm going to call them up here or something. This is great. Please join me in peer pressuring, pressuring them to stand up so that we can applaud them for their hard work. <laughs> yes, thank you. Here they are. Now you know what they look like. Wonderful. <laughs> and speaking of the team, if you, if you, <laughs> yes, yes. Now you know where this is going. If you, if you seen today, if what you've seen today looks like something you'd be interested in being a part of, we are hiring across a number of functions. Check out our job listings at reddit.com/jobs. Here are my details along with some resources. You're welcome to contact me on Reddit as GC Taylor or on Twitter as the same name. Also, please stop by Skedge. Sked? Sked? Okay. The, the thing where we manage our schedules on. Stop by that, leave a rating and some feedback for me so I can do better in the future. Uh, thanks for listening. Let's jump into QA. The team and I will hang around as long uh, until they kick us out, and then we'll probably be out in the hall. So uh, with that said, yes, have at it. Just yell it out to me. Yes.
basically uh, diagnose uh, turbulent level issues, and then I check your non-input positions, and it doesn't say anything. So I was going to ask originally, how did you tell developers about being on call at the same or even earlier tier than you guys? And then what's up with this? Are we doing chaos engineering? So this is not a like structured regimen or thing, but we are always breaking things in new and interesting <laughs> ways. Uh, we do plan on building a team out in 2019. Uh, we're still kind of working our way up from the bottom of the, the pyramid of whatever you would like to call it. But that, that's a really good question, and we're excited to break things in new and <laughs> interesting ways in the future. Yes, let's get something, somebody back further. Yes. Uh, it was, sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, Y7 clusters. So this is a Y7 clusters and how do you define the boundaries of different clusters. This too is a work in progress. Uh, so basically, and, and if you ask me six, six months from now, the answer is probably going to be different. So uh, <laughs> uh, how it works is we have sort of a catch-all production cluster. If you don't have any, if your service doesn't have any special needs, you're going to end up in this series of, of production clusters. And we tend to not uh, split clusters between AZs. So we have a prod, I'm, I'm hand-waving here a bit, but a prod UE1A and a prod UE1B, and we, uh, we rely on our tooling to hide some of this uh, as deploys are happening to the, from the user's perspective. Uh, there are certain teams that are a little bit more infrastructure-oriented or have workloads that don't fit super neatly into the current uh, feature set of Kubernetes and, and what we have in our offering. For example, very bandwidth-heavy things. There are ways to help uh, the scheduler become aware of this, but it's not a not a very clearly defined thing. So in cases where workloads are very different or there are data sensitivity concerns, you may end up with a different cluster. Uh, and those are maintained and operated by the infra team. Uh, the, the, the cluster users that are running the services, the service owners, uh, are responsible for the health of the service, and we maintain the clusters. Uh, yeah, and, and we, we prefer, as far as what some of these clusters look like, uh, we tend to avoid doing them on the bound, like naming them after teams because those tend to change over time. So it's more about the functional thing that they're, of the, the workload basically. Uh, so that's where we stand today. And I realize that is, uh, is kind of a higher level answer. So please come up and talk to me afterward if you'd like to talk a little bit more here. I'd love to hear what you're doing too because we're always trying to refine this and it's very much a trial by error type uh, situation. Yes, up front. Why Spinnaker? Yes, this is a very good question. So we did a, a, an evaluation of where things stood. Uh, I think it was about three or four months ago. Ed, is that about right? Yeah, around there. And, uh, and to be honest, there, there weren't a whole lot of options that we felt like would get us to where we wanted to go. And I think it comes down to flexibility during the deploy process, like being able to check our backing metric stores, being able to do a bunch of different kinds of rollouts and experimental releases, and eventually getting to a more automated uh, state of things than, than we have been in the past. So I think right now we're using Spinnaker in a fairly basic way, but we're really bullish on the future of the project and what it will let us do. Uh, and also, the person who led that adoption is here and will be around uh, up here to, 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 to talk if you'd like to after. Yes, I'm volunteering you. <laughs> All right. The question was, why did we move away from Helm file? And we actually still use Helm file for you know, cluster core things like uh, you know, cube to IAM and stuff that's a little bit more operations oriented. Uh, the, the problem there was that you've got a really nice declarative way to deploy things to your clusters, but you're re it's a very basic deploy flow. Basically, whatever deployments or daemon sets or the other primitive support, that's all you get. So with Spinnaker, we get something a little bit more extensible uh, beyond just I mean, it's not quite fire and forget with Helm file, but it's, it's not far from it either. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, and again, I know this is, this is kind of vague. I hope that's a satisfying answer, but uh, I, we, we think that uh, in the future we'll be able to do a lot more with Spinnaker. Let me get some, I realize I'm calling a lot over here. Let, yes? Do you guys host in the cloud or are you on-prem? Do we host in the cloud or are we on-prem? We, we, we had a very brief on-prem, I believe, back uh, over 10 years ago, and then we went to Amazon. Uh, nine or ten years ago, and, and that's where we've been ever since. We have a very, very, very small uh, presence in some other providers, but uh, yeah, mostly Amazon. Yes? What did we use for CD before Spinnaker? Yes, it was a drone paired with a Helm file plugin. And there, there's, a, there's an open source one. It's, it's not by us, uh, but we, we forked that. I forget who the author was. 
Uh, it's, 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 and it's very good if you, if you have relatively simple needs and you don't need all the fancy things that Spinnaker can do, you can't go wrong with home file. Yes? Yes, what tools do we use to launch and upgrade our clusters? I'm glad that you answered this. And the, the people that are involved, I, I am largely responsible for a lot of this, this tech debt that I'm about to tell you about. <laughs> but some other folks are also here that, and would love to talk to you about it more if anybody else is curious. We treat our, a core tenant of our platform is that we treat our clusters as very disposable. So rather than upgrade, we prefer to stand up a new cluster and shift the workload over. So uh, it looks like it's Terraform, Packer, and there's a little sprinkling of Puppet, but it's not in the critical path, so we're not dependent on it for fully bootstrapping uh, nodes. So that's worked out really well for us. I felt bad about it for a long time, like, man, this feels terrible. But now that I've you know, surveyed the scene a little bit, it sounds like this isn't as uncommon as I feel. And also, we've, we've had some success with this. Uh, so happy to talk more if anybody's curious. Uh, thank you. Good question. Yes. What do we use for making? Oh, container registry. Yes. So we had started on Quay, but uh, we had some issues. Like we needed to plug into our basically our organization's uh, IAM stuff a little bit better, and uh, we ended up shifting to Amazon's ECR. Uh, it is very bare bones. You're not going to get CVE scanning. You're not going to get anything else. But it is rock solid. It's fast, and it's already in Amazon. So it has served us well, but it is really only something that you can push images to and pull it. We had to write a front end to like a browser for ECR. It is just the barest of bones. So just know that going in. Uh, so if you don't have any special needs, it's things like Quay and Docker Hub. I mean, you may you may prefer them instead. <laughs> Another good question. Do we have a dedicated account for artifact and Docker image distribution in building? Yes, we do. It's creatively named the builder environment. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in our Helm Summit talk uh, earlier this year, if you're curious. And you know, we've got lots of diagrams and whatnot. But uh, the idea there is that it's a very locked down, restricted environment that is only for asset build and distribution. So that's only a subset of the infra team has access to that, and we try to keep it as minimal as possible. Yes? Are we using Cassandra as our database? We have. Yes. So, uh, okay. All right. So, Cassandra, uh, short, short story there is that at a high scale, uh, you, you, can, you can have a highly, rela highly reliable, highly scalable Postgres setup, but it's, it's, it's a pretty difficult. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, sharp edges to be aware of there. Cassandra gives us a very distributed. Uh, a little bit more of a safe story, a little bit more of a scalable story more when we're talking about uh, ridiculously high IOPS and query throughput. So a lot of what we do is just keep simple key value stuff. And this is right in Cassandra's wheelhouse. We don't use any of the fancy features. So we've got caching, we've got Cassandra behind it. And in, in the future, it could also give us a lot more multi-region stuff than we're doing right now. Uh, I got time for one more, one more brief question. Yes, back here. Yeah. So what's the state with start, smart stack? We did use Airbnb smart stack. So it's HA proxy and two components called NERV and Synapse for service registration and then a proxy. It is very much, it's, it's, a, it's like the, the one part of a service mesh. It doesn't give you any of the rate limiting or the, M, the mutual TLS or anything. And we wanted more of that. So we have, we have shifted from smart stack to uh, Envoy and now Istio. So that first looked like swapping out Envoy for uh, HA proxy, still pointing it at uh, our central zookeeper store. And then the next step is that we're going to start. We're going to we're going to swap in pilot for the you know again the zookeeper side of things, uh, and uh, magic will happen. And <laughs> actually, the, the person that is uh, that's going to be helping with that on the Kubernetes side is, is here in attendance. So please come up to. I think that's the music. So <laughs> I got to hop out, but we'll be around to answer questions. We'll, we'll just be out here. Thank you.